Hello architects and welcome to another video in this series on building event driven systems, messaging, all that good asynchronous stuff. And in this video, I want to talk to you about the idea of event first design. Now, this is the point where if we were face to face, we were together, I'd say to you, well, raise your hands if you've heard of the idea of API first design. But of course, I can't yet see you raising your hands. Hopefully you're all sat there at home now with your hands in the air saying, yeah, I've heard of API first design. But if you haven't, the idea of API first design is the idea that before you write any actual application code, before you actually implement anything, you first design the API of your system. And when you think about it, in an event-driven system, the event itself is the actual API. Now, I don't mean API in the sense of a REST API. Whenever people tend to say the word API in technology, people's brains immediately go to REST API, HTTP communication. What I actually mean when I say API now is the traditional idea of an application programming interface. So what you want to do in an event-driven system is to practice event-first design. The first thing you do when you want to build an event-driven system is to design the events themselves. And if you watched my last video, you'll have learned that one of the biggest points of coupling that you still have in an event-driven system is semantic coupling, the actual schema of the events themselves. So being really intentional about how you design them is, well, a really good idea, if you ask me at least. So that might lead you to logically ask yourself the question, how do I understand the events in my system? Fantastic question if that is what you're asking. And one of the ways you can do that is using a technique called event storming. Event storming is, quoting from the website, the smartest approach to collaboration beyond siloed boundaries. Sounds kind of useful, doesn't it? And if you actually scroll down through the event storming website, one of the actual flavors that event storming can be used in is to design and maintain clean event driven software to support rapidly evolving businesses. And many of you, I'm sure, are dealing with rapidly evolving businesses. And this idea of event storming was first proposed by Alberto Brandolini. And there's this whole website around this idea of event storming. And this video isn't going to be a deep dive on event storming. There's a whole lot of videos on the internet about that, but I wanna give you a quick demonstration of what event storming actually looks like. So here we are in Miro. Traditionally, you would do this in person with a big whiteboard. You'd always sticking things on the boards, post-it notes, all that good stuff. We can't do that. We're on YouTube. The same way I can't see your hands, we also can't stick things on a shared board. So let's work with what we can. And a typical event storm will start with people raising all of the different events that they see in a given system. And it's really important to remember that this is business focused. When you catch a couple of developers in the room talking about how they're going to implement this on Kubernetes and how complex that's going to be, pull them back, get them out of that conversation. Because of course, we all know the answer to that question that is if you're going to use Kubernetes, it is going to be extremely extremely complicated, too complicated, in fact. And this is a business process with lots of different stakeholders involved. It's primarily about language, about agreeing the language of the business and letting the language of the business drive the technical implementation. So you're going to have people in the room who are non-technical. You're going to have business stakeholders, product managers, developers, engineers, architects, all these people, and you'll end up with a whole lot of events stuck on the page. And then what you'll do once you've got this set of events is to put them into some kind of order, something that happens over time. So now you've got this flow of events as they work through the system. Orders are going to be created, then confirmed. Payments will be completed or potentially failed. Orders delivered, orders completed. All these different things will happen. And then you start to look at a couple of other things, usually with a different colored post-it note. You look at things that drive these events. You look at the commands that drive these behaviors. Commands can be requests from users, requests from other services. What you're trying to identify here is the things that drive the event. So somebody's going to make a place order request, and that's going to then trigger an order creating event. And you're pulling all this language together. If you have multiple people talking about the same idea, someone might call it make payment, someone might call it take payment, someone might play it tap credit card. You agree a shared language that you have in the system, and that is the primary output that you want from an event storming session. It's this shared understanding of, of which exact language is driving your system behavior, because that's one of the fundamental benefits of event-driven architecture. It's that the language of your business is driving your technical implementation. Now that you're at a high level of 
got a mechanism to actually tease out the events in your system to understand the different events that are driving system behavior. Let's now talk about the different types of events that you might see. And there are primarily two types of events. There's notification events, and there is event carried state transfer. Now, sometimes you might see three events, four events, different event types. These are the two primary ones that I see most of the time. Now, notification events are typically very thin, really lightweight events that are meant purely as a notification, of course. These are also sometimes known as sparse events or thin events, but it's something really lightweight. Event carried state transfer, on the other hand, is where you would carry the entire state of a given entity as part of the event. So if you imagine an order confirmed event, you include every single possible relevant detail to that order as part of the event that gets passed. And here is a really high level of the two. These are both order confirmed. Events. These are defined as .NET classes, but I'm sure you can kind of visualize how this would look in JSON or in your application code. And you see you've got the order confirmed event on the left. This is an example of a notification event. Really lightweight, just says the order ID. If a consumer is receiving this event, they're saying, thank you very much. I know that order one, two, three, four is confirmed. On the right-hand side, you've got the event carried state transfer or the fatter event. This is the same order confirmed event. You have the order ID, that property still exists, but you've also got the order number and the value of the order, the delivery address that's been added to this order, and also any items that are on the order. So you've got the entire state of this order being passed as part of the event. And that might lead you to ask yourself the question, which one of these two do I actually want to use? Which is the event type for me? And of course, the answer to that, as always, depends. If you look at the example of a notification event, for example, so let's imagine you've got the order service up here and it publishes that order confirmed event onto the event bus. And then you've got a consuming service down at the bottom here. Let's say this is a loyalty point service that's interested when an order gets confirmed. So the order confirmed event is published, the loyalty point service receives that event, and then it says, huh, the only property on this event is the order ID. How do I know the value of this order to be able to work out how many loyalty points I need to add? So at this point, the loyalty point service needs to go, okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna call back to the order service to actually get more information about this order to understand how much the order is worth so I know how many loyalty points to add. This, of course, still keeps that runtime coupling we talked about in the last videos, because although you've made this communication path asynchronous, you still need a callback to gather more information about the event, which might logically lead you to think, well, in that case, let's just use event carriage state transfer for everything. So same example, you've got your order processing service, you've got your broker in the middle, and then you've got your loyalty point service and the order processing service publishes that order confirmed event, loyalty point service receives it. This is a big, big event carried state transfer. It's got the value. So the loyalty point service goes, thank you very much. I know exactly what I need to do with this. It's not quite that simple though. And it's not that simple because of this idea of semantic coupling. So the trade-off you make if you use event carried state transfer or more full events is that you have more coupling at the schema level. It makes it more difficult to go back and forward to make breaking changes to your event because you don't know how downstream systems are using your events, what fields and properties they're using to actually do work. So having a bigger event might seem like a good idea at first, but actually it can cause you more challenges in the, in the long run. And it's really hard once you're publishing a fatter event to actually start taking fields out. One of the most difficult things in event driven architecture is making breaking changes. Making breaking. <laughs> I'm a poet and I didn't know it. <sighs> so, so if you were to ask, ask me the question, which is the right one to use? The answer I would give you is, of course, it depends. And I have flip-flopped back and forth so many times about this. I used to be a big fan of event carriage state transfer. You get you pass so much data as part of the event that downstream systems never need to reach back. But then actually now I think I probably sit more on the lighter events, on the thinner events, on notification events, because it's easier to go from lighter events to fatter events than it is from fatter events to lighter events. Remember, you're coupling yourself to systems that you don't even know exist. 
So you need to be really careful how you manage the schema of your events. And another example I like to talk to when I think about this is to really doubling down on the idea of microservices. There's kind of a middle ground that I like to talk about here. So imagine a very similar example, you've still got your order processing service and you've also got a delivery service. Imagine this is a hypothetical pizza restaurant that's delivering pizzas to people. And you're sat up here and all you want is a pizza. So as you are filling out the order form to actually order your pizza, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to add a delivery address to your order. And if you're building with microservices or even a modular monolith, that request to add a delivery address is going to go to the delivery microservice and the delivery microservice will store that delivery data in some kind of persistence database and it will likely return a delivery address ID. Let's say that ID is one, two, three, four. So now the delivery service knows about the delivery address. And at the time you then submit your pizza order, of course, you're going to submit the contents of the order and you're also going to submit the delivery ID as one, two, three, four. So the order processing service is now responsible for all the order information, the items on the order that were submitted as part of this request. And the delivery service keeps responsibility for the delivery addresses. And what this means is that when the event is finally published, so the order service does some validation, it checks everything on the order is okay, and it publishes the order confirmed event, for example, or order completed, whatever that event might be, all it includes is the data about the order, the things that the the data that the order service is responsible for, the actual order data, but then it just includes one, two, three, four as the delivery address so that when the delivery service receives this event, it has the context of things on the order, the data that the order service controls, and then it can just reach into its own database to grab the delivery address, organize the delivery driver and deliver you your quite wonderful pizza which will make you a happy person because you've got pizza and I know now you've all got distracted again because I've been talking about pizza again and I really need to stop doing this on my YouTube videos. So this is the kind of interesting situation you get into when you start to build a vendor and system is you need to be incredibly, incredibly careful with your event schemas. It's the number one thing I say to people when I'm talking about event-driven and message-driven systems is schema management. Think about the data you pass. Be really intentional about the schema you use. And there's a really nice pattern here that you can use in your schemas to help you enable things like versioning in your events. But that's one for another video, isn't it? I'll see you in the next one.